You ready? Mm-hmm. So you, when, how long have you been out now? I've been out for one month, 31 days, and uh, it's the 6th, so 31 and 6 is 37 days. Okay. And it's hard to adjust yeah. when you've been locked up. It's different. It's definitely different. But every day you make a little progress. And, and being as I, when I importuned and begged them to let me come home, you know, to the, it, it's so convalescent to be among my family, to be among friends, people come to visit. You know, it, it, every little bit heals. And uh, last week we went to the dinner of the National Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers, all my old running buddies uh, from the courts, and uh, they gave me a standing ovation. Wow. And that was, that was another piece of the puzzle my old life coming back, mm. so that was good. Well, that's what I want to ask you about because your own career as an activist and as a lawyer, you have witnessed, the, in essence, the death of the legal system, a functioning legal system. The legal system was always biased, especially if you were a person of color, of course, or you uh, espoused politics that the state didn't like. Um, but what we've seen is something, I think, much more traumatic and frightening. Um, and maybe you could go back, I know you defended Sheikh Omar Abdel Rahman, you were the lawyer. At what point, if you could trace the deterioration, um, what you saw happening, um, whether it predated 9-11, uh, it certainly was accelerated by 9-11. Right. Um, what, how, do you, how do you see that trajectory? Well, I think uh, it, you know, in the 70s, which is when I started practicing, was really the golden era uh, mm. because we had all these wonderful decisions and expected more and more of, of what would be fair, you know, uh, how to do a lineup, what was the government have to turn over to you as, as material before a trial, all of those things. And, uh, and of course, all the racial also, I mean, the Batson decisions, all of those. And we saw them after the 70s gradually be warmed away and end up as really being empty promises mm. and more uh, a case of what can the prosecution undermine and get rid of in these very strongly worded and very pro-defendant cases. But I think we also saw, and this, this is the part that really troubles me, uh, a, a death of the spirit of the, of the bar. Mm. that the lawyers that were defending people accused of crime no longer saw it as a, um, a calling, mm. something that you did because you were answering a, a higher voice, that you were, I don't want to make it into any kind of religious thing, it wasn't that, but you know, you defended people because they were up against the mightiest or, organism in the universe, the governments of the United States, whether they were state or federal, and it was only you, you against the world when you were in there. And that, I think, is now sadly lacking. I tell you, I'm, the stories the women told me at Carswell, women who were so cruelly sold out by the lawyers that represented them. These were on plea, plea deals then? Plea deals and also, you know, it, it's interesting, class and race all operate just as, as uh, vibrantly uh, when they're uh, lawyer-client situations. Mm. Uh, and it's funny, I was talking to my doctor daughter today and she was also saying in the medical profession as well, people just sit back and let the doctors tell them what they have to do without saying, listen, I'm doing it, you know, and, but in the medical profession, clearly the male lawyer, the male judge, the authority figures that women are trained, even women who are criminals supposedly, to respect and fear, and most of them I would say, why didn't you tell the judge this when this was happening? Why didn't you, when you gave a plea, why didn't you say, but judge, I wasn't even there. This is my boyfriend who did this. He's, mm. you know. I said, why didn't you say, I want a trial. I want to go to trial. I want to tell. I was afraid. I mm. was afraid. What do you think, what, what brought about that change? What forces 
created that shift that you talked about within the legal profession? Uh, a lot of things. I think one big thing, and I'm not quite sure how to pigeonhole it, but uh, is the fact that law education became so expensive that mm -hmm. people had to mortgage their souls in order to go to law school. When I went to law school, I, I actually went to Rutgers Law School in Newark while the smoke was still rising from <laughs> in 1971 and uh, I got a free ride. Uh, I got a, f which is uh, the vernacular by kids for not having to pay anything because I, they were anxious to have a class of more than 50% women to show that this is how it should be and also because it was a state university and the tuitions were very low anyway. But uh, Nowadays, it's in the tens of thousands, and I think when people have to mortgage their future life in order to go to get this piece of paper, then they worry so much, and they rightly so, about paying back and getting a job that allows them to pay back and still live. You know, that that was not my concern. Maybe it should have been, but, it, you know, I, I didn't have that concern. I could say, I'm going to, when... I had applied to a various places for jobs, including a couple of DA's offices, mm -hmm. which I'm glad I didn't get a job, but, uh, you know, uh, I was told you should be a prosecutor. If you're a good prosecutor, then you can be a good defense lawyer, but I'm just as glad I never was. Mm -hmm. But they said things to me, like I remember Frank Holden in New York saying to me, we don't hire women, mm -hmm. you know, just just as flat as that, just as mm -hmm. out of, but. And I could decide, I could say, I'm going to open my own office, I'm going to hang out my shingle and we'll see what comes through the door. Of course, then, as recently, I had the great support of a wonderful partner. A former boxer. A former boxer. <laughs> who likes to hang out in front of the White House and, and, and make trouble for them all, you know? Uh, hang out in a lot of places and make trouble. But, uh, you know, he was so totally supportive of this effort of mine. He had a motorcycle shop at that point, oh, really? and the, the motorcycle shop was on the ground floor of this building in Greenwich Village, and mine was on the second floor, and uh, it was very funny. Sometimes the lawyers would go to court and they'd say, but judge, but judge, her office is up above a motorcycle <laughs> shop. Like, <laughs> they were intimidated by that. But, uh, yes, and so I could start out on my own. I could take whatever cases what, what I about wanted. Um, ideological groups like the Federalist Society and um, how much of a role do you think they played in corrupting the legal system? Well, you know, I had one experience with the Federalist Society at Stanford. I was invited to be the speaker and uh, when we got to the motel there was a letter from, <coughs> I don't know who it was, but saying uh, we've, we, we've decided you can't speak. What year was that? Uh, that was when I was first uh, arrested, so it had to be 92. Pretty hmm. sure it was 92, the spring hmm. of, it could have been 93, but I'm pretty no, sure And the letter 92. was signed by who? I think it was signed by one of the deans, or the dean of the law school, or someone right. of that ilk. And, um, but the, you know, I went on the campus anyway, and there was, and I'm sorry, I don't remember her name, because she was very, very strong and very helpful, and, um, and the kids also, they were adamant that I was going to speak and they were going to sponsor me and that for this particular thing the dean didn't have to, the right to say anything about who was going to, this was their show, etc. So uh, I did speak but the audience was spiked with Federalist uh, juniors I guess you'd call them. And What did uh, they do? Well they thought they were asking very clever questions. But of course, they're asking clever questions to a trained trial attorney who had been in the business right. that way for what almost thirty years, and uh, so of course I I was able to parry with them, and I will say that the audience was so happy that I put them in their place. One one of the questions I remember, you know, I had once responded to a New York Times interview by saying that I I thought that the uh, you know propping up the capitalist system was not a good thing to be doing and if you were a lawyer you know you should think twice before you take a job that does that and so on and so forth and 
where someone had to get up and make a big speech about the capitalist system and how it formed for that, how would any of us got here? And I'm trying to think of my very clever answer, uh, which was something along the line of, well, you know, I, I sleep very well. I sleep okay. very well at night, and I look in the mirror in the morning, and I'm happy with myself, and I, uh, um, hang on one minute, what were you going to say? You remember the punchline? But you don't remember yes, it. I now do. you interrupted. That's okay. That's but he okay. said he's going to go to work for the federal government. No, he didn't say that. He said he was going to work for the capitalist system. Okay, and your answer was? And many people around the world who have been oppressed by the capitalists. No, that wasn't it. it was I was your than favorite that. aunt. I would tell you. No, that was part of it. Okay, if I, I was your say, favorite aunt. Said, and if, I was, if I was your favorite aunt, I would just have to say that, uh, you know, you're becoming part of a very ugly machine that hurts people, doesn't help them. List. I'm trying to get the forces that have destroyed the legal system. Money in the law schools, what else? Okay, I think... Uh, ideological groups like the Federalist Society, anything else? Well, I think that the, uh, the, the winds, as they blow, I think the mm -hmm. winds of change have really brought us and young law students to a very different place where they are very interested in making contacts, in hanging out with the other side of, uh, you know, of, of schmoozing it with the judge, as I say, you know, liking that, um, you know, siding with the enemy. I mean, for me, it was always, you know, those people, I don't want to, I don't want to have anything to do with them uh, in the sense of, uh, you know, being, uh, let's go to out and have a drink together. These were not my people, and, uh, but that changed. Mm. It really changed. When did you see that change? Um, I would have to say mid-80s, uh, you know, sort of at the same time that, you know, during the 80s, the federal government was uh, um, mopping up. They were arresting all sorts of people who had been underground for ma many right. years and putting them on trial for old crimes and new crimes and um, certainly by the end of the 80s that was over there were mm. no there were a few isolated cases of people that were still out there but it wasn't like they were going to get a whole network but after that was over I just had the sense that the lawyers were no longer uh, part of the part of the game I guess you'd mm. say you know it was the government versus us you know um, Maybe there's another less high-profile case that I won't ask about that was important, but I want to talk about Omar Abdel Rahman. Yes. Predates 9-11. Indeed. Um, from everything I've seen about the case, it was completely bogus. Yes. Um, you know, basically they arrested him for his political viewpoint. Would that be correct? Well, I think it went a little deeper than that, Chris. It was his political viewpoint, but it was more his ability to lead the masses of Egypt in a mm. counterattack on Hosni Mubarak, whom he made no bones about despising and calling out and being very forthwith <coughs> about that. Uh, you know, he was accused of being part of uh, the group that assassinated Sadat and went to trial and won right. uh, defending himself and uh, then was placed for some bogus reason on house arrest and then in uh, which I I don't want to go into because I'm not really sure what the answer is but managed to get a visa to come here as a religious person and did come here um, so he was really the opposition and a leader of the opposition and I think he was considered very dangerous by the United States government and mostly by the Egyptian government and this was really a plan to take him off the scene, to get him put away where he would no longer exert the influence he had. So because, you know, he had a large following here yeah. and um, and he was, I will say this, he was a very dynamic man. I mean, I, didn't, I don't speak any Arabic but I rec you recognize it when you see it. You know this is someone who means some something. Was that trial, I mean maybe at that point you understood the system so well 
um, or was that did that trial sort of jolt you and shock you perhaps it, it I'll tell you I always say to people the only time I ever cried in the courtroom huh. was when the judge who later became Attorney General of the United States Mukasey um, we had formulated an entire defense based on the notion that the government's theory of what a sheikh or an emir does is erroneous and what they do is really rather benign and they give advice but they're not out there burying the AK-47s under the palm trees. And we had enlisted numerous experts to come in and talk about what is jihad, right. how do, you know, all of the, the, the key words the government loves. And, um, and actually the judge had approved all of these expenses for this one guy who was Dutch and was the jihad master for Jim Asbarisk was going to come in, the ex-senator, the only, I think the only Muslim senator, I don't know whether he's Muslim or whether he's just Middle Eastern, but at any rate, he was going to talk about how Muslims felt that they were being hunted at all times and they maintained low profiles. It wasn't from guilt, it was from the reality of the government. Anyway, um, when the time came to prevent, the present, prevent, pe present, the defense, um, the judge very, very differently said, well, I want to hear what everyone's projecting as a defense because it's silly to go all through it and then have me disallow it. So everybody had to get up and, and give him a preview. And when we got up and gave our preview and this witness for this and this witness, he said, no, I'm not allowing any of the ones that uh, have to do with what is Islam, what is jihad, what, what, what. he says, it will only confuse the jury. Well, I just couldn't, I, we argued and argued and I brought that to the person. I couldn't believe we would take away our entire defense, you know, and that's what it really amounted to. So the jury never got to hear anything but the government version of who the Sheikh was and how this had operated. Was that a kind of seminal moment in terms of did you realize, at what point did you realize, or maybe it was then, maybe it was later, that it was kind of over, that the legal system was beyond salvaging. No, I had um, I, I had my doubts long long yeah. before that, long before that. Yes, because I my practice was largely uh, uh, young men and a few women from the from the forgotten places, as you have so eloquently talked about them, the throwaway places, the throwaway right. kids. Right. And I knew the system totally failed them right. from beginning to end. Right. From the moment they were born, schools, I had taught for many years, I knew the schools were hopeless. Then they get to be... You were, you were a school teacher before you were a lawyer, right? Oh, yeah. yeah. How many years? years? Ten, Ten years. years. I was a, In Harlem, a librarian. Right? Yes, were you? I was the school librarian. Oh, I told so cool. stories, yes. Wow. And then I got in front of juries and some claim told more stories, but uh, <laughs> but just uh, elucidated the facts huh. as they should have been. And But I knew that, you know, that the system, I, I was a dyed in the wool by the time I got out mm. of the 60s. I, oh, definitely. I mean, we did Vietnam. We were, my husband and I were both, we, well, we always laugh and say, for the first 20 years of our relationship, I was Ralph's old lady. He led the community control of school struggle here in New York and uh, ended up getting arrested for uh, knocking down a few Brawley NYPD and uh, went to jail. And of course, they yanked his license at that point. They couldn't teach anymore. But, um, and I also, I had, we had lost the community control struggle. And I said, if I stay in the schools, I'm going to be a, some kind of a shopping bag lady. So I said, so he said, well, what do you want to do? This at this point, I was tell the story. Uh, we had two kids. I had two kids. He had four kids by a prior marriage. And we had one on the way. And he said, well, what do you want to do? I said, well, you know, I always wanted to go to law school. So did, did he say, no, keep teaching, we really need the money, you know, we really got all these expenses. No, he said, I guess you better do it. Wow. Yes, so, you know, that kind of partner is really fabulous. Um, so tell me about when, when did, did, was there a certain moment when you lost hope in the judicial system? Well, see, I always believed, Chris, that I could do it. You know, mm -hmm. it's like, you know, it's like you're the last man, you're like the kicker. 
after they've, they're running the ball back and you're the only one between the goalpost and everything. And, but I was there. They had to get by me. If they couldn't get by me, then they couldn't win. I always, and I have, enough, I have enough ego and belief in myself to say I didn't believe they could do that every time, that I could win, that I could make a difference. And uh, I think I did make a difference for a lot of people, uh, even the people who got convicted were still very, very, you know, and you, you know jail, what it does, it corrodes yeah. you and corrupts. And, and of course, the first thing to toss into the garbage is the lawyer. The lawyer did it to me, you know, but right. I had an occasion to go to Sing Sing many years after I, when I was uh, a very successful lawyer at that point, and people I had defended way back when, you know, who got sentenced not to lifetime. They were so happy to see me, and they were embraceable. And I said, "You see, that's that's what's totally lost. There's no sense on the part of the client that that lawyer is his champion." I I made a speech for Ralph Reddit for the National Lawyers Guild. I read saying, it. I read it. Yeah, that, did a good job, know, Ralph. That, that <laughs> old uh, that old theory that we it was a the, beautiful speech. That champion is great, but still with the Omar Abdul Rahman trial, you were surprised. Yes. I mean, that was maybe a step towards shutting the door completely. Uh, completely. You know, I mean, I, I got into the case because I was doing so many buy and busts, etc., that I was literally, I needed something new to look at. Mm -hmm. I had I had almost gotten into the original World Trade Center bombing uh, through one of the people who was convicted, and uh, the Judge Duffy, who was never my friend, he made sure I didn't get in. He refused to. He he refused to pay for expert advice, which was sorely needed. Of course, the lawyer that replaced me never even asked for the expert. That's another story for another day. But at any rate, I I felt that the Muslims were 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 the new, uh, if you excuse the use of the N-word, you know, that that was how uh, Americans were looking at Muslims and that they were targets of the government, even back in 95. Mm. And certainly this outspoken man who was, uh, uh, what was he, he was the poster child of, of, people still say, who, you know, was convicted of bombing the World Trade right. Center, in which he never was, was never right. even indicted for it. He was mm. a, it was an unindicted act, it was an indicted, act of the conspiracy that he was ultimately convicted but there was no findings of who was involved and who wasn't and I really believe he was never involved in that and he was certainly never involved in this conspiracy to blow up landmarks uh, right. although he said some unfortunate things which uh, because we weren't able to present how that would come about the jury never had any understanding that this was daily, daily routine for a person of his stature. Right. People come with questions, they answer the questions. But at any rate... What... So, for, you see the deterioration within the legal system. 9-11 appears. Is the legal system at that point utterly dysfunctional, or does 9-11 finish it, or fo follow a little bit the mm -hmm. process? Um, well, I would say that, uh, you know, it was not entirely dysfunctional at that point. I mean, you were, were still talking before, able, before 9 before 11. Before 9-11, yeah. I mean, right. uh, you were still, as I said, able to go in and one-on-one -on -one try the case, talk to the jury directly, uh, you know, be able to convince them of, of common sense and what was going on here. But after 9-11, when the, the, the playing field suddenly changed and it was everything favored the prosecution, certainly in federal cases. I mean, there was no, you know, there was no level playing field anymore. It was like if you were, if you were the last guy standing and you had to keep them from making the goal, you were at the six inch line trying yeah. to do it because that was impossible, right. you know, to, to stop them. They, they controlled, they controlled you know, uh, they controlled what the charges were, they controlled, you know, how, whether an adjournment would be given, they determined, you know, whether the cooperation is worthy and everybody must cooperate, and 
you know, it changed into a very different system, certainly on the federal level. And these were all from basically a raft of legislation that were passed immediately after 9-11. The wish book, I always call oh. it. That, uh, what was it, a 400-page document that oh. the Congress admitted none of them ever read it. They just passed it. And that, and that kind of irrevocably altered. It, it was finished. Then. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Along, along with the war on drugs, along with all these other uh, catchphrases, you know, that they use to justify what they're doing. In other words, you know, when you send a, a mother with three kids to jail for 30 years, right. you know. Now, when Hannah Arendt writes Origins of Totalitarianism, she said that what was the kind of um, foundational element for uh, fascism was this, were the stateless people like her who had to flee to France had no documents and no and she said they created for the stateless omnipotent police forces that could do anything they want in the same way that we have created omnipotent police forces in marginal communities for people of color they can stop you on any pretext they can kick down your door they stack ridiculous amounts of charges onto you to force you to plea out because you've only got 10 minutes with your lawyer. Um, to what extent did that war on drugs and the creation of these omnipotent police forces then become magnified, especially after 9-11, throughout the wider society? Well, I think that the glorification and fear, which was instilled in all of us, by uh, the circumstances of 9-11 and by a government that was only too happy to instill that fear as a way of bending the will of the people. Uh, I'll never forget my son-in-law is blonde and blue-eyed and uh, his mother was saying at one family gathering, you know, well, I don't mind, they can search me at the airport for all they want. If it means we prevent this happening or somebody getting killed, I'm happy to be searched. And he said to her, he's married to our interracial daughter, and he said, that's fine for you, Mom, but my wife is stopped every time. She is stopped endlessly because she fits the profile. She, and she has a name. My daughter's name is Zenobia, so she's got a name that is instantly suspicious. All of the, the little, what would you call them, the things that twig law enforcement to look twice at someone and harass them. Right. I mean, we have spent a lifetime, Ralph and I, being stopped by the police. I mean, even <laughs> even now that he's 79 and I'm 74, you know, they'll roll up on us because we're an interracial couple, per se, suspect, yeah. you know, and uh, uh, it, it, it's quite amazing. And I think that's what took over in the United States, that willingness to just say, listen, I'll do anything so I never have to look at my television with that building falling down again, even though without wanting to understand, you know, and I'm along with Susan Sontag when saying, you know, we've never explored why. Why did this happen? Why, what compelled 21 young men to give up their lives right. to do this thing? No, we've never, we don't want to look at that. We don't want to know why. What is the difference between our legal system and the legal system of a classical totalitarian society, communist, fascist, at this point? Well, I think that we continue the facade that we are fair, that we have this constitution we respect and we can rely on and that we can raise, you can't do that, that's my constitutional rights, etc when really they don't, they're puff of smoke, they don't really exist. Um, they, they um, what would I say, uh, my husband likes to say they don't put any smoke on it anymore, but the fact of the matter is they don't need to. They mm. just, it, it continue, it's sort of self-perpetuating fairy tale uh, that people buy into. Um, so, but the, truly, of course, I, I've thought about it a lot, and I thought about, you know, uh, because I was a great admirer of certain other uh, governmental systems, particularly the Chinese in the early days, and of course Cuba, and, you know, 
And I have always said I like the accusatorial system mm -hmm. as such where the government has to prove you guilty. Right. You don't have to prove yourself innocent because I think that puts such an impossible burden on a human being. And I, I like that they have a burden to do that. They're the government. they got all the resources, whatever, the Chinese or Cuban or whatever. But um, uh, I don't, we're, we're not seeing a whole, and it certainly doesn't exist in this country anymore either. So, kind of a thing of the past. So after 9-11, you're still practicing law. Mm -hmm. What's changed for you in the courtroom? No, you know that's. Uh, I I can't. Uh, I could plead chemo brain that I really don't remember. I'm trying to really cull my brain here. Um, I mean, do you suddenly are you running into impediments that were not there before? Yes. For example, I mean, even in my own case, when I got arrested and the and the U N cry was raised that that you know they were listening in on my. And let, let me just back up and correct me, but but basically you were arrested for passing. A message from Ogda Arakman to Reuters. Right. Is that correct? Right. Well, it wasn't a message. It was a right, outright uh, press release. Press release. It was saying, "This is my view of this," which was uh, had to do with a ceasefire that his group had entered into a right. many a couple of years earlier, and um, but yes, it, it was a it was a written statement right. and. Uh, uh, I lost my train of thought here, but anyway. Well, we were talking about your own trial. Oh, yes. I, well, you know, one of the, the things that just outraged people was that this was before 9-11, but they still listened in mm -hmm. on all on the conversations conversation. with him, That's which right. were attorney client. we thought was privileged. How did you find that out? In, when During the trial, they produced the transcripts? Yeah, well, earlier than they said that they had listened in, you know, and we got all the tra and we got the, the silliest thing, they did it through a hole in the ceiling. <laughs> so you would hear talking, and you would see our hands and drinking a soda. But they were filming, they water. were filming it. They were filming it from the from top the down, the but you couldn't see anything. Was this at the MC, where was it? No, at, it was at uh, right. a jail in Rochester, Minnesota. Oh, oh right. Yeah, yeah, he was in the medical facility. Um, um, but you know that was such everybody was so outraged when they heard about that but under the new um, rules of the uh, what is it called the, the, the law that was passed after 9-11 Patriot, Patriot Act that was no longer a problem but when they did it the Patriot Act hadn't been passed no it hadn't been. so it was technically illegal technically but uh, but the judge found that uh, it wasn't a constitutional right, you see. It's not embedded in the Constitution, the privilege. The privilege is just honored by custom and usage, not, you know, oh. uh, it, there's nothing slippery than, more slippery than a judge who wants to get to the, the, the determination he wants to get to. So that was never, uh, never, a re and, and then he pointed out, of course, that under the Patriot Act, this would be, now perfectly all right. In, in your own trial, um, I mean, your own trial is kind of a, a watershed in this sense that it completely illustrates the breakdown at this point yeah. of a functioning legal system, wouldn't you say? Uh -huh, I would say so, yes, yes. And what year was that? The, the trial was. actually, we were arrested in 92 in the spring about uh, you know six months after 9-11 right. and then the trial was e not even though for all of this activity was predated 9 what year were yeah. they arresting you for activity for what year 90 90 90 90 yeah 90 okay 90 and the um, um, it also was a uh, um, trying to think there was a Another thing I was going to say about it, but uh, anyway. So, it was 90 when you were arrested. Right. 90, yes. I was not right. arrested in 90. I was arrested in 90. If if 9 11 is 91, right? Right. So, I was arrested in the spring of 92. You were, So, when you were arrested, it, it, it's such an egregious violation. Were you worried? Or did you think this is ridiculous? What did you? Well, I was. I, well, you know, the the famous story, which I have, I guess, stump speeched on all the many years, was 
you know, we had we were living in a different house then. It had a stoop, which in New York is where you go to sit on the steps in the summertime when you can't afford to go to East Hampton. But at any <laughs> rate, uh, um, we were getting ready to go to court. We were rushing around. I was still upstairs. Ralph was out on the stoop. And I hear him talking. And I'm saying, what is he doing? And then I hear the dog barking, our dog barking. And I go to the door and I hear him saying, I don't see any badge. I don't see any warrant. What are you doing here anyway? And so the guy, I come around the door and the guy looks and says, uh, and he was clearly cop, you know, the, the cheap shoes. And, the, and he says, we're not here for you. We're here for her, pointing to me. Before that, I had said, when I, uh, the best part of the story I ruined just a minute ago, but when I came around the door, I said, Ralph, Ralph, take it easy, take it easy. We'll have you out by lunchtime. You know, I thought it was one, you know, he's the guy that goes and gets arrested at a PTA meeting, you know. Uh, I thought it was one of his old warrants right. jumping up or something. And then they say, we're not here for him, we're here for you. Well, I was flabbergasted. Huh. I could not, you know, I know it wasn't for forgetting to sign my income tax return. They don't send a, a squad out, you know, with all those cars. So, uh, but I knew better than to start asking them about it because that comes back and then suddenly you're shown to be uh, less than forthcoming if you're asking questions about something you should have known about, you know, or whatever way the government wants to twist it. So I just... I did remain silent, mm. and I really didn't find out what the whole thing was about, or even who was arrested with me until that afternoon when we were allowed to meet with lawyers and shown the indictment and uh, and told what was going on. Did you think that you would get off in court? I did. Mm. I definitely did. I thought that uh, that. Uh, what was the official charge they leveled against you? For? Well, the most important was um, materially aiding a terrorist organization. And their theory was that it, the aid was providing my client's voice to the world through that press release. Wow. The judge dismissed it the first time around. I know, before. Yeah, before. And then Cheney, I think, was it? said, no, no, we're going to do this again, yeah, right? Yeah, right. I believe so. I, I never got the exact personnel, but I think that would probably sounds right. The man without a heart. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I guess he has someone else's heart now. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, or something, something akin to a heart. Or. Uh, um, and at what point did you realize, uh-oh, I'm getting lynched? The rulings during the course of the trial, some of them were so so, so bizarre. Mm. And when they put up on the screen, my co-defendant had some tapes. These were your like paralegals, right? One was a paralegal, and the other was the interpreter. Right. Um, when uh, they had found some books and tapes and things in his basement where he had stored them. And uh, among them was a uh, uh, some kind of conference being held in the Middle East where Bin Laden was present, and it was a free the Sheikh conference. You know, typically, typically right. not unlike right. many conferences we have here for many prisoners. Right. And um, but they took that picture of Bin Laden and in, in, enlarged it to to fill an entire screen that had to be. Oh, 10 feet by 12 feet, huge, which they unrolled in front of the jury. And this was after the judge had assured the jury the case had nothing to do with 9-11. These were the prosecutors? Yeah. So how did they justify that? Well, they said that it wasn't introduced for the truth of the matter. It was only introduced for the state of mind of my co-defendant. Mm. And they gave that instruction 750 times during the course of the trial. That didn't have anything to do with me. So did you realize very early on? Well, not very early on. It took a while. The trial took a while. Right. You know, it started in, um, what was it, May, June uh, 2004 and went on until February 2005. But um, 
I realized that, that we were getting a hosing by these guys. Mm -hmm. There's no question about that. At what point did you think that you would have to serve prison time? Um, after that conviction. When I was oh, convicted. really? Not till then? Yeah. No, no, I didn't. And I still had hope for the jury. You know, mm. I'm, a, I'm a, an old campaigner. You always think the jury's going to pull this out. You're going to convince them and then oh. we're going to go. But not so. Not so. And you were sentenced to, what was your sentence? Three years, was it? No, two and a half. Two and 20, a half. 28 yeah. months. Of which you served how much? I didn't serve anything. I was uh, the judge let me stay out pending appeal, and so I was out, and the appeals were presented, and uh, it was not until after the appeal with that uh, rip snorting, right wing, <laughs> bull of an idiot who uh, who apparently likes to. Uh, uh, who has a penchant for, not a penchant, but he was found to have hit a state trooper up in Connecticut and never stopped and then had to be brought to, uh, they went and talked to him and apparently, but at any rate that was the judge who wrote and said she didn't get enough time. He tried to convince, as, as we understand it, he had a real campaign with the other two judges to try to get them to say that the sentencing was not legal, which would have left the door open for the judge to basically do anything he wanted to do, but uh, they would not be convinced of that. So basically, he just said that he didn't consider certain things. It has the same effect, probably, but and it was sent back to the same judge who, of course, in true American fashion, uh, at that point, uh, I don't know, I, I shouldn't be so, so blithe about it since he's very, very quickly signed my release papers to get me out of jail once he knew I was cancer and all this and would have done it a lot earlier if the government had given right. the papers right. a lot earlier. But he, uh, he did quadruple the sentence to 10 years. It was a 10 year sentence? 10 year sentence. Okay. And he, uh, and they also ordered that I go in immediately. I had surgery pending. I was supposed right. to go, and that they wouldn't hear that. They just said, "Go in, go in, go in." So I did. Now, you you worked with many clients who went to prison. Yes. Now you're in prison. What did you learn about prison, e even with all of your knowledge? Once you're in prison, what did you learn about prison that you didn't know before? Uh, I don't think I ever appreciated the unrelenting stress hmm. of the place, that you're always <clears throat> waiting for something to come down, that there's such arbitrary authority. Guard A says, go down those stairs, use the stairs. Guard B says, you can't use the stairs. You're not permitted on the stairs. And you say, but guard A just said, I don't care what he said, this is my rule. Mm. That kind of arbitrary thing, you're always guessing. What is this guy, what does this woman want me to do? Mm. Where am I, where is this? You know, and that's 24, that's, that's all the time. Well, not when you're sleeping, obviously, but, but you're mm. always on that cusp of, mm. of doing the wrong thing or getting mm -hmm. in trouble for mm -hmm. something you never I mean I wrote a letter for a woman and in order to make a copy I emailed it to Ralph so I could get into that part of the the very very limited computer that we had to, to make a copy for her it was basically asking a judge to stay any decision because they were going to take all of her pension as a payment for what she had done and she wanted to get this letter in right away so um, I've emailed it to him, and for that I lost, I think, about three months of uh, uh, commissary and email, all, all the good, all the good things. That Where you were you at this point? I was at Cartersville, well. um, which is in Texas, right? Which is in Texas. Yeah. Hmm. What else did you learn about being in prison? Well, I learned that it's almost impossible to organize prisoners in this day and age to stand up to hmm. to to become a unit, to say no to certain things. Um, I had thought it was be like 
the old days that I, you know, where prison, we considered the prisons one of the great resources to recruit people for the political things ahead. But I found it virtually impossible to convince the women at Carswell that they should not be always thinking that what happened to them was personal. They should be looking at political answers, that where they ended up was not because of some personal lack or weakness, but because the political system had designated them to be there as one of the, the, the kick-arounds, as one of the um, not for consumption. Of. Why do you think that is? I'm, I'm not sure. It's a very interesting question. Not one. I think that uh, you know, people. Uh, I, I I have to say, I think the television has a lot to do with it because it it, it gives a certain idealized uh, you know life. You know, people that are in trouble get there because they've done it to themselves, and and then they fight and they are able to get out of it, or they get some help from someone and they're able. But um, I really don't know. I think well, I think for many many of the women in there, it's they have no self esteem at all. Mm -hmm. They don't they don't think in terms of that this was something that was put on me, not something that. You know, they can think about it in a limited way. In other words, if it's the boyfriend who said, carry this package to Joe's house and they are therefore placed in a big conspiracy, they understand that much. But, um, you know, they'll they'll see that only in terms of, and why would they put me in jail for all this time? All I did was carry a package, you know, that kind of thing. Rather than say, I realize, you know, that, that this was what they had in store for me and... Uh, and I'm going to fight it. They did a lot, a lot of women do a lot of pro bono work. It's um, It used to kill me. There was a lot of uh, exploitation by people who held themselves out as You being, mean within the prison? Yeah. What do you mean by that? There were women who held themselves out as being knowledgeable in the law. I see. And they weren't. I see. Um, but because hope is what you're really selling. You're selling that, and uh, and I I worked with people. I never asked for anything in return. Although you know, as I said, these uh, these others would sometimes uh, get money. You know, put in their commissary accounts for the work they did, and uh, etc. But uh, um, and uh, as I have said many times since I've been home, this is the one real shadow on my tremendous joy at being home is that the women I've left behind that I can no longer even communicate with because right. the conditions of my probation are that I may not associate with any felons. So I can't even write to mm -hmm. Dear Mara what happened with your case mm -hmm. involving someone who uh, who got 20 years because she sold some heroin and then a guy died a week later and they used that murder to enhance her sentence, you know, completely contrary to everything we ever learned about. What was, for you, the most sort of heartbreaking thing about being in prison? What was it that, you know, for you, within prison, kind of ripped your heart out? Well, I think it was this women, well, at, at various junctures, but, you know, particularly at mail call, mm. for some reason. You know, they would deliver the mail, they would call out the names, people would get letters. I got a right. lot of mail. People always, kind of funny, wanted to know, how come you get so much mail? Are you, so, is that your church? Is that your mm. family? I'd mm. say, no. I said, that's uh, 74 years of, of living a life that makes people respect and love you. And I said, I'm very fortunate in that. And they would look at me sort of disbelieving, but the women who never got a letter, wow. who sat there and day and you know, and waited for their name to be called and wow. it never happened. And people who never got a visit, you know, who are in there and they're becoming you see them become more and more institutionalized. By that I mean the world of the prison is the only world. There is no you know, the outside world does not exist for them any longer. 
And I know even for myself, you know, the visits that I got, they bring you back to reality. We never saw children, for example. Right. The only way you would see children is to go to the visiting room and the people's kids visiting, you would see them then. But and how many of these people were mothers? Oh, I would say vast majority, right. vast majority, almost all. And, but you know, living a little far away, can't, the expenditure of making a visit is enormous. Uh, the problems attendant to getting in, getting out, you know, you had to, had, couldn't wear underwire bras, you had to do exactly what the guards told you to do. So uh, uh, visits were a difficulty, but more than the visits was the people who never ever got them. And that's, mm -hmm. that's one of my semi-quarrels with uh, you know, what is it, orange is the new black, you know, mm -hmm. that, they sort of gloss over that, that there is real tragedy in these prisons. It's not just, you know, superficial, um, what would I say, soap opera variety. Right. It's real, real tragedy. So, to quote Lennon, mm -hmm. you know, where do we're we go? We're in trouble from, now. <laughs> where yeah. do we go from here? I mean, what, what do we do? For those of us who want an open society, for those of us who want to defeat corporate capitalism, yeah. we can't go to the courts. Where do we go? Well, we, uh, what I'm happiest about my getting out, and I have to say it's the happiest part of it, is that we were able to organize so many people and we organized them not around uh, well we're this organization and we're supporting her and then the other organization well we can't if you're supporting her then we can't if you're yeah. you know <laughs> everybody had to come in on it there was no way you know we didn't let anybody slide and right. and and say that they weren't going to support everybody was invited everybody was invited bring your own banner whatever it says but right. but support Lynn and uh, and that was that's really the most uplifting part. The numbers, the numbers of just everyday people, the fact that people were moved by the situation. And as I say, I mean, I, I, I couldn't have scripted it better. Maybe you know, uh, here's this this champion of the people who loves her work, who loved the the people she defended, who who ends up in jail and cancer comes back to claim her and. All she wants is to go home to be with her family, and and uh, they're blocking that, and so on and so forth. But um, so I mean, it was it was scripted for whatever, even though it was totally real life. It was yeah. really happening, and um, but I still have faith in the power of the people. Look at this. I I don't believe it was our brilliant arguments or that my lawyers, you know, had. It was Ralph. It was Ralph, to, Ralph who wouldn't let anybody rest. Yes, that's right. But it was other people too, all over the country, all over the world. Yeah. You know, people that, that you know were not there seeing Ralph, but who just were moved by the situation, or because uh, person A got an email from her old college friend. And this email said, you know, I've become very involved in this campaign to bring Lynn Stewart home. Do you know anything about it? I'm going to send you some stuff hmm. by via email. And then that person would then go to 10 more. I mean, it's organizing in the new-fashioned, old-fashioned way. You know? What about, at this point, somebody going into the law? Is it hopeless? I mean, what would you tell a young law student who actually wanted to do the kind of work? I, I got a lot of letters. Mm. A lot of letters said, Lynn Stewart, I want to be a lawyer just mm. like you. Mm. And I, you, I always wrote back and I said, if you have the fire within, the fire in your belly to do the work, I really want to do the work, you know, and it's not always easy. Uh, you're really pitting yourself against the greatest, the most powerful. But if it's what you really want to do, then do it. Do it. Mm -hmm. Don't turn your back on it. Don't say it can't be done. It can be done. And as I said, maybe it only can be done at this stage of the game. I mean, I have a son that I'm living with here that uh, is a full-time practicing criminal defense lawyer. And mm -hmm. one of the nicest things about living here is, you know, he'll come in and tell about his day and what kind of case he was doing. And, and uh, it's sort of uh, a nice deja vu moment. Uh, but 
I do feel, I do encourage people who want to be lawyers, and especially if they write me these heart-rending letters saying, I want to be just like you. Uh, you know, I, that was the other story we told about the, you know, uh, how we were riding in some place in New York traffic and the bicycle messenger rode by and tapped on my window and said, you the lawyer, you the lawyer. And uh, this girl, nice young woman from San Diego wrote and she said, that story changed my life. She said, because I want to be the lawyer. Wow. This was uh, recently? Recently, yeah. Wow. Yeah. Let me ask you just to conclude. You probably would be comfortable defining yourself as a rebel. What does it mean to be a rebel? Well, you know, I have a, I have a little quibble because, of course, I love words, and rebels to me invoke guys in gray uniforms, which I don't like. But at any rate, uh, I, I do rebel. like them in the Irish sense, which was always used by a, a certain group that I represented. They always were, they, their parting with each other always was up the rebels. And uh, it, it basically means to take everything, to look at everything with a grain of salt, to say, I, I don't accept anything at face value. I'm not going to become a yes person for this government or this uh, corporation-driven society or this um, what would you say, bling society that loves all its baubles and cars and everything else. I'm, I'm a, I am I'm, want to be the person who says it's not that way, but I want to be able to say it in a way that people understand it, not where I'm high and mighty and I, I, and I don't subscribe and uh, I, a lot of people, I, they know it, but it's not widely spread. I'm not... I'm not waiting for the working class to make the revolution. Mm. I think that's a day long gone by. That might have happened in the 30s and it didn't. We have to look at a new way, some new force. And to me, it's only there is a certain level of disgruntlement, of disillusion among the people. Yeah. They're not a happy bunch, but they're not unhappy enough to do anything about it yet. So. Whatever I can do to be a catalyst for that, I will certainly, that's the rebel's job, mm -hmm. I think. But I also, you know, Rosa Luxemburg always said, and we've talked Lenin, now we'll talk Luxemburg, okay. she always said, you know, you had to alleviate human misery along with doing mm -hmm. your political work. And certainly for me, human misery is the political prisoners. These 150 so men, mainly men, who were jailed back in the Black Panther, right. Black Liberation Army days, who are still in prison doing outlandish 30, 40, 50 years, um, basically because they can't ever get past a parole board, they can never get clemency, because the police powers, as we talked about earlier, are so powerful. Especially, there are certain places, pockets, the New Jersey State Police yeah. being one of them, uh, that they, that, and so one of the most touching letters I ever received, and I received it before I went to jail, was from Matulu Shakur, who was convicted along with a group of others involved in the Brinks case in New York, and he said, you know, the absolute faith that the political prisoners have that you, the political people, will someday get us out of jail. Mm -hmm. And I thought, oh my goodness, mm -hmm. I don't see a whole lot of movement on that front. Mm -hmm. I don't see much happening that, to justify that faith. But I'm going to work at it mm -hmm. as much as I can. That's one of my goals. My other goal is not to turn my back on the women in prison, mm -hmm. who I think have a, are a very special category and are Virtually, you know, you can. They, they have hairdressing classes, and they have some education classes, but they're certainly not real education as we know it. There's so little opportunity to get a degree or do anything else. It's it's sad, but at any rate, I want to do both of those things connected to prisoners uh, as my down front work and my my. Uh, other work is just to be a voice, be the vo one of the voices that speaks up whenever things happen that we know have to be made clear and cogent and somebody has to say, hold it, no, 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 no. And you are disbarred. 
Yes. So you cannot practice law. Cannot pra can't even work in a law office. You can't. No. Wow. Yeah. And what I, about? I miss it so terribly. Do I you? Can't tell. Yes. Awful. Mm. I I liked it. I liked mm. the work. Mm. Well, you were damn good at it. Yeah. You slowly tell me. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chris. What should attorneys do in the face of such severe repression, especially if they're progressive-minded attorneys? Fight like hell, uh, you know, within the limits, whatever it is. Uh, well, fight like hell outside the limits, as, as, as they accused me of doing, but fight, 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 never give up. There's always a struggle, there's always something to be gained. And this is from Heidi uh, Bogosian of the National Lawyers Guild. Uh, what advice would you give to activists in the current political climate who may be intimidated by government anti-terrorist rhetoric? Someone out in Seattle asked me that question before I went to jail, and I, I said to her, I said, the most important thing is don't let yourself get isolated. Mm. Don't feel that you're the only one in the world that thinks this way, and you must be crazy or something, and they're going to get you because you're the only one. Find the other people who think like you. They're out there. There are people out there. There are groups. There are, as everyone from the Raging Grannies, right up to, you know, the very serious lefties. But there is somebody out there. Make sure you're not all alone. Yeah. That's the worst part of what we face these days. Uh, and as long as you're with other people, you have a fighting chance and you can organize more people. And then that's the old Marge Piercy poem, you know, about uh, if there's two of us, we can do this. If there's four of us, we can do this. And uh, as it progresses in the poem, you know, if we have a hundred, we can change the world. Let's hope. And finally, Lynn, I'll never forget reading what you said about prison being such a loveless and frightening place. Isn't is that so much of what's wrong with this system we live in that we're trying to change? Well, uh, prison is the microcosm. You know, Dostoevsky said it. Uh, it is what the society is that builds it and puts people in there. And this is a pretty loveless world we live in. It's, there's, there's, you know, we have lots of romantic love. We have lots of sex in the city. But real love, love that is the kind that, you know, saves people and makes the world better and and makes you uh, go to bed with a smile on your face, that love is, is lacking greatly. You have to search for that. We'll never give up. Thank never you. give up. We love never you. give up.